All right, we're gonna kick things off. Uh, hello, everyone. I want to thank you for coming out. Uh, I'm Christopher Stefani, I'm assistant director at the DCDT, and we are here tonight uh, to enjoy the company, insight, and uh, musical stylings of one <laughs> Garland Gilchrist. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, I was very privileged uh, to see Mr. Gilchrist speak at the 2016 Detroit Design Festival. Um, there he really focused on technology's role in design and the creation of systems uh, in the context of a sustainable Detroit. Um, before we jump in and welcome Garland up, I'd like to give you a little background on our distinguished guest. Um, Garland Gilchrist II is a native Detroiter who embodies a passion for advocacy, technology, and policy. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan and holds degrees in computer science and computer engineering. Upon leaving his alma mater, Gilchrist moved to the West Coast where he began working for Microsoft as a software performance engineer. During his tenure with Microsoft, Garland also founded Opportunity uh, Technology, held a fellowship with Northwest Progressive Institute, a strategy center that looks to raise America's quality of life through insightful research and imaginative advocacy. He sat as a board member on the Seattle MESA, an organization that looks to engage diverse students in STEM-based activities, and much more. In 2008, Garland served as the social media director for President Obama's election campaign and recently served as the national campaign director for Move On, one of the largest progressive digitally connected organizing groups in the United States. Well, this is a short, while the short list has not began to embody uh, the many positions and accomplishments of Mr. Gilchrist, we are most excited to welcome him here tonight to speak about his current work. Garland is the city of Detroit's first ever deputy technology director for civic community engagement. His job is to open up the city's public data and information for the consumption and benefit of all Detroiters. With our recent opening of the Detroit Center for Design and Technology, the February 15th launch of the center's new economy initiatives like our business accelerator, um, and our focus on transdisciplinary and multimedia practice within the college, we concluded that there would be no better time to welcome someone of Garland's uh, stature to come share his experience and insight with us. So without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Garland Gilchrist II. Thank you, Chris. All right, good evening, afternoon, evening, everybody. I am really happy to be here at Lawrence Tech. So when I got here uh, to see Chris and park the car, I was telling him that I actually have spent a lot of time on the different parts of Lawrence Tech's campus. So going back to the seventh grade, I was, I was, I'm a Detroit kid. So I was born and raised um, in the city in the suburbs. And I was participant in the DAPSEP program. For those of you who may or may not be familiar, the Detroit Area Pre-College Engineering Program. And there, uh, the first time I actually came on Lawrence Tech's campus was through a program called Laser 7. It was this uh, five day a week summer academic enrichment program, which sounds amazing. I know just listening to that, where um, I got a chance to like be with about 25 other uh, kids who were my age in the seventh grade. And we like basically got together, played all sorts of games that were subversively teaching us how to do math really fast in our heads and stuff and also got to play a lot of sports. Um, it was a great experience and it's really great to come back here to Lawrence Tech to see people, to meet people, to learn things and hopefully to contribute uh, to what you guys are doing here um, to further your education and careers. So you almost got everything right. <clears throat> so you did a good job. The work I'm doing um, at City of Detroit, the place I love, my hometown that I came home to two years ago to do this work for the city. It's another new job. <clears throat> the title I have now is the Director of Innovation and Emerging Technology. It's a fancy title. I got to make it up, I admit. But it's also a really loaded title. It's a title that has three words that are like in decreasing order of buzzworthiness. So let me try to define that and then relate it to what I want to talk to you about tonight, which is designing for participation. So first, innovation. What is innovation? Innovation is a word that a lot of people throw around, that a lot of people don't use without really having a clear definition for it. 
I think something is innovative if it is some combination of being new, different, better, and more valuable to the people who use it or are served by it. Now notice, that definition of innovation has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with startups. It has nothing to do with youth. It is about making something new, different, better, more valuable to more people. That is not a discriminatory definition. It can really, anything can be innovated by that definition. It's about how you apply it. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Emerging technology. All that means is technology has never been used before in a given context. And for better or worse, me working for the government, there's a whole lot of opportunity for emerging technology. Like seriously, there's a whole lot of opportunity for it. So, so my, my, uh, my boss, it's the chief information officer of the city, um, she had some Herculean efforts to take on when she got to city government. Um, things that some of us take for granted in the private sector, like email and printing. We have to make that stuff function well in city government because people deserve that. To have their government has to be able to print stuff and communicate with things, that's really important. So innovation and emerging technology, new, different, better, more valuable to more people with the potential of applying technology in a way that has never been applied in a given context. But how does that relate to you as possibly a design student? We need, I need, Detroit needs, our communities need, our cities, states, our country, our world needs. Design thinkers like yourselves to think about how you can maximize the way that your designs innovate people's ability to participate in systems, in processes, and in places. Now, what do I mean by that? By participate, I simply mean how can someone be a part of and have a full experience with a design? So that can be some part of the built environment. It can be a building, a room, a space. But what I want to talk more about is about how those pieces of the built environment impact systems and processes. And unfortunately, over the past couple of months, we've seen some very chilling examples of how design that does not fully think through how people will interact with and participate in a given system, process, or program that takes place within a space leads to that space being exclusive and leads to that space ultimately creating harmful experiences rather than enjoyable ones. This is not a political lecture, but I want to talk about voting. I want to talk about the process in the city of Detroit about how people voted might have seen on TV or like read online or read a newspaper, some of you, about the nightmare that was election day from the perspective of how many Detroiters experienced or had negative experiences at their polling places. We had everything from like running out of ballots, running out of paper, machines breaking, ballots getting lost, people not knowing where to go people being confused about the law. And also, polling places being organized in ways that just didn't make sense. Let me give you a personal example. So I vote at the Frederick Douglass Library in Detroit. It's on the corner of, well not quite the corner, but it's basically at Grand River and Trumbull on the west side, in Woodbridge neighborhood. So me, my wife, my three-year-old twins, my son and daughter, we, we get up in the morning, we're all set, I'm gonna take my kids to vote because I'm a good parent and I think the kids should go with their children to vote. My, I remember my parents, they would like take me and I would like get to fill in the bubble, which might have been voter fraud, I don't know, but I used to do it for them. <laughs> um, so I, I take my kids with me to vote. Um, it's great, they're excited. Um, they got their little t-shirts on, ready to go. Excuse, they were late to school, we excuse that an hour and a half late to school because it took me more than an hour to vote. I don't know how many of y'all have ever met three-year-olds. 
three-year-olds plus an hour of anything that they didn't pick is a bad combination. So I get in, so, so we, get to, we get to the library. We're gonna go vote. We come in the door, we kind of have to walk around. There's like not that great a signage as to where the voting actually happens in the library. It's kind of in the back in this big open room. But okay, I voted there before I actually know where to go. Get to the back, see a line full of people. I don't think that's exciting when there's a lot of people waiting to do something. I think that's daunting. We get into the room. There are three lines that people have to stand in. There's a line of stand in to fill out one piece of paper that says who you are. You have to stand in another line to give one person the paper that says who you are. So they give you a third piece of, a second piece of paper that says, okay, now we know who you are, get in this other line. You stand in that second line, you give a third person a piece of paper who is like, okay, here's your ballot. And here's this piece of paper, this magic piece of paper called a privacy screen. And then you take that paper and magic privacy screen and you get into the last line, which where you wait to get into the polling place and actually the, the voting booth and actually vote. Now let me give you some numbers. There are approximately 30 people in the room. There are approximately, and not approximately, I mean exactly 14 privacy screens. There are exactly five voting booths. I don't know many of y'all are math majors, but those numbers mean that people have to wait. There are a lot of experiences and spaces that are designed for people to wait. You wait for elevators. There's like this study I remember reading about that said that um, the way they, the, a way that a, 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 a large skyscraper wanted to like reduce wait times for people in the elevator, they were getting annoyed. They wanted to make it so people felt like the elevator was coming faster, but they couldn't like change how the elevator worked. That wasn't their job. But they changed the space to make the perception of waiting seem short, the time seem shorter. How'd they do it? Anybody heard this? They built upon that classic human tendency toward narcissism. And they put a mirror next to the elevator. All of a sudden, people enjoyed their waiting a lot more. And it seemed like the elevator came faster and it smelled better. They changed the space, which changed the experience. So let's think about the voting experience, and what it would have been like for me, a young parent, an eager voter, with young children who I want to experience the polling place. So imagine we go into this room. The line, that, that, that's okay enough. But imagine that we actually have access to the entire room rather than half of it because the other half had like tables and chairs folded up in the corner and stuff like that. Dead space. What if it was like a fun place to take my kids? I want my kids to have a civic experience on this day. I want them to experience voting in an election. This is the first time mom and daddy like voted for a president. I like told them who the president was, told them who we were gonna vote for. That was all great. We want people with families to vote. We want kids to experience the, have this civic experience. We want them to participate fully in this day. Maybe we could have used some of that dead space to give people that opportunity for experience. My children weren't the only children in there. There were actually seven children in there between the ages of two and nine. I know that because I was in there for an hour and a half. I talked to the people, right? Imagine having a space off to that side in the dead space where our children could vote, could do stuff, could color. They could have their own experience. Mama, look what I did. I checked the box. In order to enable that, someone would have had to think about, someone would have had to design Someone would have had to innovate upon the voting experience, upon the way that we use these spaces to make them more welcoming and encouraging and inviting of participation. Because what that experience said to me and to a lot of parents was like, you know what you shouldn't do? Bring your kids with you to vote. Because it's gonna be awful for all of you. And if you don't have enough snacks in your pocket 
or your cell phone battery is dead, good luck with that. Because I ended up just shoving my phone in my kid's face while I voted, rather than giving the experience that I wanted. That's awful. That's not making the voting process something that we allegedly want everyone to participate in who was eligible. That's not making that accessible. That's not designing to maximize participation. That's cutting out people with small children. That's cutting out people that don't have a lot of time to stand in three different lines to get an inadequate number of resources to cast this thing that we allegedly care about. We need to think about how we design for participation. I'd argue that a design that doesn't invite, enable, and yet actually maximize the number of people who can interact with it and use it is a bad design. I'm not talking about art, where like participation may not be an important goal of a particular piece of art. I'm talking about function. I'm talking about how the decisions that we make can really encourage people to be part of making our design a success. Let me give another example. In my work, I work with a lot of data and information. So there are a lot of people who have a lot of questions about a lot of things that the government does in Detroit. They want to know how decisions get made. They want to know how much of a certain thing we did in a certain day, how many building permits did we issue, how many houses did we demolish, how many times did the police get called. They want to know things. My charge was to design processes that make those answers discoverable and accessible. And even beyond that, my colleagues were working on problems like when people want to know who to call to fix something, how do we design an, a, a solution that is trustable? Because for years in Detroit, if you wanted to do things like get a sidewalk crack fixed or get a tree taken down that was falling across your driveway, you had seven numbers to call. Not really sure what would happen when you did that or when you would go into the city hall building, the city county building, we call it, it was exacerbating trying to figure out, well, where actually do I go? This space was not really well designed for someone to come in and actually access a service. That's a failure. So in my own work, sort of designing experiences around information and accessibility, and for people to be able to participate in how they are governed because they have access and understanding of this information, I had to think about it in terms of who are these Detroiters. So some of y'all might have heard statistics about our city in terms of things like technology access, access to the internet. Depending on who you ask, about 45% of Detroiters don't have consistent access to high-speed internet in their homes. Because of that statistic, some people thought that my first solution to this information problem, which was to write a policy and build a website that exposed information about city government and public, public data information, thought that was an incomplete solution. Like, that's fantastic. Everybody can't use it. Good job. Way to go, technologists. And certainly, if we would have stopped there, that would have been completely insufficient. Those people would have been right. What do we have to do instead? We had to take the way that we approached making that information accessible and maximize the number of people who could participate in that information, interact with it, and utilize it. So what did that mean? That meant taking a multi-platform approach. The analogy here is having multiple ways to access a space. So for example, if someone wants to come in the top door, the bottom door. That door has barriers. You might have to come up a stair or something like that. This one is barrier free. I can come in and this one is, I can, I can reach accessible seating. 
in the technology context and the data context, what that meant was we needed to make this information available for people who had access to the internet and who didn't. So we had to do it in a few ways. So the first way was people might have internet access, but a lot of people have cell phones. Actually, about 85, 86% of people in the city of Detroit have a cell phone of some kind. So we worked on putting out a way for you to be able to maybe text a question. Text messaging is a rather accessible technology that's heavily utilized in Detroit. Maybe you can ask a question via text message and get, an, and get the answer to that data question. Maybe your person doesn't have a cell phone. It's 14%, okay. But you are a person who's willing to go to a place when you have a question, a rec center, the city hall building, the place you pay your water bill. What if we could train the frontline staff at those places to be able to utilize the website that they have access to because they're an employee to be able to field and answer questions that people have, the ones that are common? What if we had those people positioned in such a way in those places of business where it was obvious that they were, willing, they were willing and able to take those types of questions and provide that type of information. In other words, what if we designed the offline, in-person experience with that information? Which meant we might have had to edit some spaces, edit placement of people and things in order to make that accessible to more Detroiters. So we provided new information that wasn't available previously. We provided it in a better, more multifaceted way. We provided it to different sets of people who previously couldn't access it because they didn't know it was existed or was available to be given to them. We did it for more Detroiters because this was something that almost 100% of them could access through some way. And we believe it's more valuable because designing for participation is actually designing for accountability, which is critical when we're talking about public service and we're talking about government. It's very difficult to hold something accountable if you can't observe it. On the other side of that, we can maximize accountability through, through observation as well because you can't design something or redesign something in particular if you also don't observe it. So there's a direct connection between people who are willing to take on these types of design challenges, to think about design in this type of way, to observe, to act on their observations, and in turn create more value for people in which they can hold their institutions accountable. It's actually kind of shocking to me how much, um, how much we pigeonhole our, our concept of design. As a non-designer, I guess it's easy for me to say, like, I really think that so many of our different processes of participation would benefit from design thinking whether that's the ones I described, the voting booth, the voting process, the polling place, whether that's the way that we interact with one another when we're trying to make public decisions. Have any of you ever been to like a public, like a, like a meeting where you're supposed to give feedback on a policy? The reason you haven't been is because they suck. They're really bad experiences. They are optimized for the most agitated as opposed to being optimized for the most impacted. That's a design problem. Not just from the perspective of like the when of the meeting, the how of how it's facilitated, of how feedback and interaction happens, but also the where. Like literally where is it located? And how the meeting interacts with the space that it's in. 
So like, I don't think this room would be a really good place to hold a public meeting. But maybe if we had, so, but, but, and there are a lot of public spaces, public meeting spaces that are set up really similarly to this. They don't have like really great lights and HD cameras and um, seats on levels like this, but they're essentially optimized for, for one person to talk at a lot of people. Now, my apologies for professors in the room, but that's not the greatest way to get information from a crowd. So what if instead we reimagined the spaces where that type of dialogue and discourse took place and we optimized them for participation? We optimized them for conversation. We optimized them for consensus building. That would change the layout. That would change the lighting. Why do I get all the lights in the room? That would change the way that people move, the traffic flow in a space. All of that stuff matters in terms of wanting people to really fully enjoy and want to continue and have repeat participation in experiences and spaces. Like, unfortunate story, one of the reasons that I don't utilize that particular library that much, because when I go there to vote, I'm reminded of how awful I think that experience was. And it gives me a negative connotation of the space. Bad, bad service experiences, bad participation experiences impact the way that people perceive designs, impact the way that people are willing or unwilling to tell somebody else to go check that out. Think about that. When you go to a restaurant and you get bad service, like you're not likely to recommend that restaurant. Same is true for any type of design, or excuse me, any type of process that is designed for participation. It's the reason why probably none of you have been to a public meeting because no one ever suggested that you go to one because anyone you know who went to one was like, yeah, you don't want to do that. But we can make that better. Y'all can make that better. The design principles, the design approaches that you have learned, are learning, and are applying in certain realms, whatever, whatever realms are your focus of interest, I'm actually challenging you to apply it to an alternative domain. To apply it to a domain that's focused on getting more people to participate in the systems that matter to them. I'm a software engineer by training. I don't write software anymore. Not because writing software is unimportant. Not because it's uninteresting. I don't do it because I figured out a way to take the principles, the structured thinking, the problem solving skills, the analytical skills that made me a software developer and apply it to a different set of challenges. I decided to prioritize what I wanted to focus those skills on was not making a startup, although I did that, but it wasn't that. It was about innovating, new, different, better, more valuable things to more people because I wanted more people to have ownership over the decision-making processes that affected them. That's why I came home to work for the city of Detroit, the city that I love. That's why I came home to try to make as many pieces of our government accessible to as many Detroiters as possible. Because every person with a question deserves an answer. Every person who wants to participate deserves to have a process designed to make that easy. And in order for that in order for us to reach that type of scale for solving that type of problem, those types of problems, I need all of y'all, all of y'all classmates, all of y'all peers who are thinking about design, challenging yourselves in ways to challenge yourselves to maximize that participation potential. So with that, thank you very much for coming here tonight. And I, know, I don't know if we get time for questions. Um, can we do that? Uh, great, so thank you.
I just uh, have a comment, actually, and, and uh, thank you. I think probably you were involved somewhat with Improved Detroit. Yes. So thank you for that, and I just want to let you know that uh, I and my neighbors uh, have really been having a positive experience with, you know, being able to go on the phone, put in a problem, and it, it, even if the city isn't the, the entity that fixes the problem, finding that out in a, in a timely way has been fantastic, so thank you. I'll be sure to pass that on to my colleagues. Thank you for that. So uh, as a director of innovation and uh, knowing Detroit's history as an innovator in vehicles, yes. where do you see the innovation climate heading in the city? Is it gonna be more industries? Is it still gonna be a vehicle leader? Uh, and you see a multi-industry climate arising, how do you see the future? So I think that one of the um, unfortunate shortcuts of the way history has told the Detroit story is that it limited the scope of innovation to the automotive sector. Um, our region has been a leader in healthcare um, for years. Our region has some of the best uh, higher educational institutions in the country. Um, we are one of the most educated regions in the country today, um, more so than even Silicon Valley or Seattle or Silicon Alley in Boston. Um, so so just, I, mean, I want to start there because I think that when we're talking about how the um, innovation economy and just environment broadly will grow in the future, I think it's going to continue to be diverse and probably even more so. Um, in the automotive space, like I think that you've seen um, from both big three companies as well as uh, some of their, a lot of their suppliers have been really encouraged to think more broadly about what it means to get people and things from point A to point B um, that may, improve, may include more than private car ownership or personal car ownership. Um, I think we'll see more than that, although that's a sea change um, in terms of a way of thinking. But here's a nugget, though. So while the assumption is that, man, like in Detroit, like everybody got to have a car, we actually have one of the highest rates of, we actually have one of the highest percentages of people in the country who like don't own their own cars. So roughly 27% of Detroiters don't own a car. It really makes you think about um, the need to prioritize, again, participation and like great experiences in things like public transit. But we're one, of the, we're one of the few regions in the country who's had like this juxtaposition of low rates of private car ownership and underinvestment in transit. That's one of the reasons why that's been such a priority for the current administration. So I think that, to answer your question directly, I think we're gonna continue to see really great um, innovation in research related to health. Um, both driven by our hospital systems and, our, and the surrounding university systems. I think we're gonna to continue to see great investments in innovation and mobility more broadly, sort of getting beyond just cars. And I actually think that our city government is really poised to, because we sort of started from this very low place, we have an opportunity to really change the way that our government systems work. That could actually be a model for a lot of cities who are in the same boat. Um, there are a lot of cities in this part of the country who have some of the same problems that Detroit has both um, socially and financially, that may not happen to the same degree because they're smaller. So we have an opportunity to actually demonstrate what it means to recover and reinvest in an inclusive way. And I'm excited about us trying to really create models for that. So do you think that in the future you see the government working with the big three or other companies in terms of with the rise of autonomy and the prioritizing of public transit? Do you see that, that kind of uh, coming together? I think so. I think, and I, 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 so I think, I think there certainly will be more opportunities for public and private partnership um, in, 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 in a lot of areas, not even just transportation. Um, I'm just happy that our uh, brothers and sisters in the big three have realized that um, the definition of mobility, the definition of getting from point A to point B is more broad than we used to, than we used to talk about it. That's, that's exciting to me. Which, which aspects of design innovation and change if you consider the future needs of smart cities? 
I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, Hello? Which aspects, important aspects of design innovation will change if we consider the future needs of smart cities? So which are the important, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, I think there are a number of them. Well, let me, let me answer it a little differently. So I don't think that the, I think that the characteristics of innovation are going to remain constant, the characteristics. But on a tactical level, um, a few things are going to happen. One, as much, much more focused on what could be the benefits and potential drawbacks of connected infrastructure. So the city of Detroit made a humongous investment in public lighting. These uh, brand new LED street lights, like 65,000 of them all over the city. Actually, like lighting the street is just the first step or just the first iteration of what those can deliver in terms of value to the city. There's networking capability and possibility there. Like theoretically, we could use that infrastructure to directly address our technology and internet access problem. Now, it costs a lot of money. There's some legal frameworks that would need to be worked out to enable a municipality in the state of Michigan to do that. But we put the infrastructure in place that could potentially be helpful there. So the connected infrastructure in terms of the ways that it can be leveraged, that's the first thing that I think is really going um, really to start to help us brainstorm bigger possibilities. The second one is, in order for some of our stuff to be smarter, we have to make some investments. So for example, there's this uh, streetcar coming in Detroit, it's called the Q-Line, running up Woodward from downtown to New Center, 3.3 miles. Brand new things, and open in the spring, should be great. In order to that, that's gonna use this brand new payment infrastructure where you can like use a card or like pay with your phone and all these kind of things, like really cool stuff. But really, we would love it, we would love for it to be the case where you could use just like one card, one system to pay for all your transit options in Detroit. Well, in order to do that, we need to make a multi-million dollar investment in the payment infrastructure in some of our other transit systems, like our bus system or the people mover. P-Mover payment system has been updated since like 1987. So in order to set the table for these innovations to, to really thrive, we do have to make some infrastructure investments. So I think that where we are strategically, we want to think big, but also think about what it takes to, what building blocks we need to get there so that we can like be practical in terms of, well, how do we get this building block in place so that we can then get to those big ideas? So, so you know, that's where we're at. I guess I'll give you one more, though, to, to more directly answer the question. So, so there's connected infrastructure. And I also think that as more people um, are more connected via devices that have higher capacity in our connectivity. So right now, for example, in the city of Detroit, we have a lot of people who have smartphone actually have we're sort of overrepresented in terms of smartphone ownership in our city but a lot of those smartphones have sort of limited data plans and internet capability as that begins to evolve as pricing models shift and um as uh simply older phones like become obsolete or become useless i think more people sharing more information and being willing to connect via their devices will actually enable more opportunities for information sharing from the public sector to private citizens, which is something that, again, is a pretty nascent concept. Like, that hasn't been happening on a technical level to this scale for more than, for, it's been happening for less than 10 years in a couple of places. But we're really, uh, but, but only 2% of American cities actually have some formal policy around like sharing information with their citizens digitally. So it's actually pretty on the, on, the, on the early end of that, but I think a lot more cities are going to want to do that, which is going to lead to a lot more of opportunities, a lot more business models, a lot more um, chances for people to build experiences um, with that information and data.
that could be quite rich and will lead to, there will be a lot of innovation built on top of that um, platform of possibility. So uh, during the lecture, you talked about um, a lack of uh, design thinking in a lot of everyday problems that we have. And I was wondering, uh, I guess I'm a little biased being an automotive designer, but I've always kind of thought like, oh, you could easily fix this problem if you thought like this. And so I was wondering where you think that uh, kind of disconnect comes. I mean, do you think that will change in the coming years, considering Michigan has the highest designers per capita of any state? Um, why do you think that arose? Uh, where do you think it's going? So let me, let me address that in two ways. So one, um, I'd be careful about thinking stuff is easy. Um, very few, very, very few things, everything looks easy when you have a little experience with it, right? So I, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be careful of that. I do think that an era of welcoming multidisciplinary thinking has, has come to be or is, is a process of coming to be, which enables like a dude with two computer engineering degrees to come talk to design students, right, first of all. It enables no formal public, public policy experience to like write public policy for the city of Detroit. So I think that one thing that opportunity for designers to contribute in more ways to more things is the fact that we are beginning to be more open to people with, to teams skill sets working on problems together so that's one that's that that ethos of that type of collaboration that type of team building I think is one thing that that helps I think the second piece is for better or worse there are a lot of aspects and I'll just use the public of, of the capital P public like sort of the public sector um, that want to behave more like the private sector. I think, there are, I think there are actually some significant drawbacks to that sometimes. But in the case of like wanting to create great experiences for customers or citizens or residents, I think there are a lot of benefits to that. And in the private sector, I think there, are, there has been a realization for some time that great customer experiences don't happen by accident, but they need to be designed and thought through. And so taking that and applying it to more domains, um, I think is becoming more, po more possible as more people, and the technology helps this, right? Like technology, like people have interactions with well-designed things all the time in their pockets. So it makes you more comfortable in understanding that, oh, like someone had to make a set of decisions to make this work that way. Maybe they can make a set of decisions to make this thing work better as well. So I think that openness or that, that, that makes more opportunity for designers to participate in things. And then the last piece is, I think that just on a generational perspective, you know, I'm a millennial. Millennials, I hate that word, but millennials. Like, we actually want to do things that matter. Like, I quit Microsoft because I didn't think making enterprise document archiving software for like Shell oil company was an inspiring thing to do. I wanted to like help people do stuff. I wanted to do stuff that was more like my first job. My first job was, um, so my mother was a, an accountant at General Motors and she, uh, there was a PC tech, a young guy who would like fix her you know, Lotus Notes and um, printers and stuff, right? And he had a business on the side where he would build computers and, and, and like deliver them to people and install them. It was like Dell, but a black dude in Southfield, right? She convinced him to let me work for him, which meant go to his apartment and build computers and not get paid for it. And the first five computers I built, when I say built, I mean like put RAM onto the motherboard, take like a SCSI cable, plug it into a hard drive, plug that into the motherboard and put it in a tower, were delivered to a community center, a rec center in Detroit, Bustle. I got to teach a class there 
that bustle. Teach people how to use a computer, gotta write a curriculum, all this kind of stuff, right? I'm 14. Excuse me, I'm um, 15. In that class, I showed a little girl, an eight-year-old, showed her the internet for the first time. I taught this old lady how to use the mouse playing solitaire. That's a designed experience, right? Play solitaire, you know how to play solitaire. Oh, wait, use this click thing? This is awesome, right? That was designed, that was on purpose. I helped a woman use Microsoft Word for the first time to make a resume because she was entering the workforce again after her children had gotten a little older. My first experience with technology as a professional was helping people get new experiences, was opening up possibility to people, was helping them participate in the world in a new way. SharePoint, enterprise document management, paid well, but wasn't that. I think our generation is built like that. Like we want to do things like that. We want to apply all the smarts and all the education that we got all the student loan debt for. Like we want to apply that to something that matters. And I think that's the biggest thing that's opening up this possibility for designers to insert themselves alongside other people with formal training and informal training, with formal experience and informal experience to make processes better, to make them more open, to make them more inclusive. Put one more in the back here. Um, on topic of uh, smart cities. Yes. Uh, do you envision designers becoming data genera generators? Do I envision designers becoming data generators? Data generators. Yeah. Yes. I'll, 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 I think designers will have two roles in that. There is data generation. I think. For better or worse, we're all going to generate data in a smart cities context, whether we know it or not. Um, but I actually think the role of the designer should be thought of as a data facilitator. What I mean by that is how do you enable people to, one, have an understanding of and control over what data they are sharing or communicating? And should they want to contribute more data and information, how do we make it easy to do that? So I think that's about creating systems and mechanisms for people to opt in or opt out as a design problem. How do you opt out of an air quality sensor? How do you opt out of a pedestrian counter? I don't know, you should design that. How do you, if you want to make yourself more available, if you want to, for example, so the, so the uh, Southeast Detroit, excuse me, Southwest Detroit is a neighborhood that has an oil refinery, which has led to that neighborhood having the highest asthma rate in our state, I mean, one of the least healthy zip codes in our state. There are people in that neighborhood who are very, very, very motivated to tell that story. They're hungry to be like, yeah, 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 no, no, no. I will tell you every time my kid pumps her inhaler because I'm pissed off that my kid is breathing poison. How do we design mechanisms to make that easy? How do we design inhalers that can do that, that are connected and that are smart? How do we design information acceptance mechanism to do that? Do they need to have a kiosk they can plug their inhaler into that's like on every other corner? Does it just, is it a wirelessly connected inhaler that plugs up to computers in the sky that just like tell the health department where all the, where all the, um, uh, where every time it's pressed and where that press happened and how much medicine was discharged? Do we need to build a mechanism or a place for people to go for support who are all dealing with this same challenge. I think those are ways that designers can facilitate the exchange of data in a smart city and a smart and connected city. Again, that's space design, that's process design, that's service design, it's information design, it's a lot of different disciplines wrapped up there. But that's the, I think those are the sets of roles, the types of roles that will be played as cities get smarter and more connected.
Thank you very much, Garland. Thank you. <laughs>